David uh, McKellen, is that the right pronunciation, David? That's David, perfect, that. David is 56 years old. A year ago, he was diagnosed with grade three breast cancer. He said he had a full mastectomy, then lymph gland surgery. Um, he's at chemotherapy and radiotherapy, and is now on hormone medication for up to 10 years. He says every day this disease, <clears throat> excuse me. We're just coming back to him, sorry. Let, let's, let's, uh, let's have David first and okay. then Levinson afterwards. Okay. Uh, David says each day brings with it, with, it, with it new challenges, physical and mental. And uh, it's all about how we approach the challenges, which is what makes all the difference. He takes each day as it comes. And he says, cancer is a roller coaster of a journey. You have to buckle up and learn to understand the ride. It sounds like a very, very good sort of introduction to you. And David, over to you, uh, for what you have to share with us. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Kerry's going to put up a... Or have I frozen now? No, I'm still here. Um, yeah. I'll just put up your frozen. presentation. Right, there we are, yeah. Right. So... Is this... Is it up? Can you see it, everyone? Can you see the screen? And if you put you it on slideshow, no, that's you it. Can't see your no. Can everyone hear me right? Yeah? Uh-huh. All right, fair enough. So the first slide is literally up for only 10 seconds. It was the only slide that I could find that has got dark clouds looming. <laughs> yeah, the idea behind this was, if I take you back now 12 months to June last year, um, very much like uh, the Dean said, men are very bad at going to the doctors. And at that particular time in my life, I'd been going to them quite often, but not really getting to the grasp of things that were really going on in my life. And on this particular day, um, I decided to go with another issue that was going on. Um, a lot of the problems that I were, uh, was experiencing was that you couldn't tell the doctor more than one thing at a time. So you go in, you might have a hundred things going on with you, but you can only talk about one thing. So I had to sort of in my head work out how to say it. So this is what I did. I went in right at the very end after discussing something else. I said, will you have a look at this and tell me what it is? <laughs> so... As you can see there, I've got I had an inverted nipple on my right side. I'd had it for probably about six weeks. Um, and I had sort of, to a degree, put it off a little bit. But um, my main reason was for not going was because I didn't know how to sort of brought, bring it up. So I, that was what I did. I went to the doctors. They turned around and said, we're going to send you to the breast clinic in Oldham. It will be done within um, two weeks. We are doing this in a fast track sense just so that we can eliminate all problems. But hopefully there'll be no, no issue. Uh, so next slide, please, Chris. Unfortunately, when I went on the uh, two weeks later, it was actually 10 days later, I went there and I saw a gentleman um, who examined me. The minute I took my shirt off and he saw the inversion, he basically turned around and said, <clears throat> we're going to go through the procedure, he said, which we would normally do for a lady as well which will be, we will give you a mammogram. And then we will also, if required, we will do an ultrasound scan. And if that um, needs to be done equally, we will do a biopsy. So he said, looking at you from now, he said, I'm not wanting to sort of cast complete and utter doubt on it all, but I believe that it doesn't look very good because most men that present with an inverted nipple will be at the latter stage of a, uh, of a breast cancer. So that's, exactly what happened I, I i ended up having um the mammogram then from there straight in to the next one uh to the ultrasound and the lady there turned around and said to me that it wasn't a cyst it was definitely a hard lump and that a biopsy needed to be taken from that so i did that and then unfortunately the the rest is a little bit of history in the sense of where uh, you know, I, I developed uh, i'd had cancer i was told two weeks after that for definite um, when the results came back that it was a, originally it was a grade two uh, breast cancer but because it had gone into one of the lymph nodes and then they had to go back after the mastectomy operation I had to have all the lymph nodes take, no, no, was taken out of my shoulder my arm, my armpit, my chest <laughs> five nodes, uh, thankfully only one of them, the original one they found the sentinel node was the one that showed cancer the others didn't 
<laughs> and from having that done, like I said, um, there was the operation for the mammogram, and then a month later they did all this taking out the the lymph glands, <clears throat> and then I did have an awful lot of infections. You can see that picture there with the plaster on. That's the one of the neatest ones. I could have shown you some awful ones, but I didn't want to. <laughs> but the idea was to show you that, unfortunately, that cancer also carries the risk of infections and one thing or another. And this is where the, the mental health side impacts on some cancers, in my opinion, because at that point I had a cellulitis that didn't just didn't want to go away. I'd had it for about nine weeks, delayed the chemotherapy. And in the end, they turned around and said, we'll have to just get on with you, the chemotherapy because we can't leave it any longer. <clears throat> but... Um, it was hard work that because I, I think I had seven different types of antibiotics just to try and shift it and it just, nothing would move it. So if you look at the picture in the top right, my bold head, <laughs> Christmas morning, uh, we were getting ready to come downstairs to go and see the grandchildren. And I started the chemotherapy on the 17th, no, the 12th, sorry, of December, <clears throat> my first session. And on Christmas morning, I got up looked in the mirror, sort of rubbed my head like that, and all the top of my hair fell out, all the top of my head. <laughs> so one, I thought to myself, I'm not going scaring any kids anymore this morning. So I asked my brother-in-law to, um, his nephew, my nephew, to shave all my hair off. And uh, at least that way, it didn't scare the kids. They didn't need to know they were too young at the time. So that was that. If you go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so... The journey I then sort of had with breast cancer started off like a little bit tricky in the sense where I realised that breast cancer is really rare in men. Um, depending on what websites you look at and the numbers, uh, it's between 350 and 400 men a year are diagnosed with breast cancer. <clears throat> and up until recently, there was very little out there for men with breast cancer in the way of support services. So I bought the first T-shirt on the left, uh, not all cancer is pink deliberately. So when I went for all my sort of appointments at Manchester Hospital or the other hospitals I had to, have, had to go to, it was so that because I'm sat in predominantly um, female waiting rooms for these tests to be done, I would just literally sit there with that T-shirt on to start a conversation because that way people would then realize that men also have breast cancer or also get breast, we, we have breasts so we can also get breast cancer. So it was a conversation start more than anything. In the beginning, a lot of the groups that I tried to join uh, were a bit, you can keep that on, that's fine. Uh, the, the, the other groups that, were, uh, that I had were predominantly ladies because 56,000 women a year get diagnosed with breast cancer. And this is in no way uh, in, or shape or form me poo-pooing the, the campaign for, for ladies' breast cancer. The pink element is fantastic and it, it needs to be there. It's a strong message of unity and sisterhood where they can all come together and look after and support each other. But for men, there was nothing. And unfortunately, some of the ladies' groups were very sort of particular saying, no, we don't want men in here. We show our wounds, we show our scars. And I accepted that, totally understood all that. And um, But it doesn't mean that it it's right because to me it, it made me feel even more lonely more isolated when i first got diagnosed <clears throat> the men i knew in my life and i'm talking people that for 30 years i've known men walk across the other side of the street rather than talk to me i've known friends that were so-called friends didn't ring people that i used to sort of have acquaintances with would just literally get up and walk away because they didn't know how to breach the subject of, of one cancer but breast cancer in men it's looked upon as though from some people as though it's there's something wrong with you because you've developed this well that's sort of rubbish in my mission from now on if you saw the other picture with the breast cancer the pink t-shirt that's it, it, my message is to go out and tell people that one men have breast tissue therefore we can get breast cancer two you should check your chest just like you would check down below i mean i've written a poem that basically if you check the crown jewels you, you, the, the best things first then check your your chest after it's all part of you you know you don't believe that you can't get these things and that's the myth behind a lot of um a lot of the, the stigma around bre breast cancer in men is because they, most people just don't believe that men can get breast cancer well i'm living proof that you can so the pictures here uh, next were the on the 6th of june i rang the bell from 
um, the it's the Christian Oldham that where I finished my uh, treatment for the radiotherapy treatment, and it was just completely surreal. COVID had <laughs> run a mock, mock by then, so all my uh, radiotherapy instead of having fifteen sessions, I had five, but I had them times three in strength, um, and I'm now suffering for it. Um, but on the day that I rang that bell, it, the one person that was on reception took the picture for me. There was no one else in the building. <laughs> it, no, no one else was allowed in in the building, so no one could clap, no one could be there for me or one thing or another. And if you look where that picture is at the back of it there, behind that door, is literally there's another unit in Oldham called the Victoria Unit. And my sister-in-law that you see below, she got diagnosed a month after me last year in the September with small cell lung cancer. And on the day of me ringing that bell, she was also told that it had gone into her breasts. So we were in the same building. She'd been told that she had got into her breast. It's also gone in her brain, her spine, her abdomen. And we're at the moment, we're, we're losing her. She's at home in you know, a hospital, brought the beds and everything out. And we're in the last weeks of her life. And, and the cancer and the, 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 the bit that I, the message I wanted to get out more than anything regarding the mental health side of cancer is that when all this was going on with me, because my sister-in-law, God bless her, always knew that hers was terminal, my cancer just didn't exist. It didn't, wasn't there. No, it wasn't talked about. Even now people say, that they act as though it never happened, as though I never had it. Um, even though, like I said, I, I'm in constant pain now with the medication, the hormone treatment. Um, but it doesn't mean that it, it, it's gone away. Um, and, and one thing you must always do with cancer, I, I believe, I'm a firm believer, you've got to find a way of releasing the angst and the anger and the emotional side that this brings with it. Because if you don't, it will carry on doing what it's doing and that's eating you alive and I'm not going to let this thing beat me in her memory when she passes away this picture will continue to follow me wherever I go and talk about breast cancer in men her picture will follow me because it's as important to me that she's remembered as I'm uh, I'm my message is remembered because it has a massive impact on on, on everyone's life cancer and it, it, it can be very soul destroying it can be very divisive in its root and but as, as people as individuals as family I think Winston mentioned it earlier if we all talk and we all get on with each other and we all stick together and love each other believe me in the long run this would be a better thing and the last slide I think is well there's two slides this one I've got to show you so at the beginning I showed you a real doom and gloom picture of the big cloud hanging over my back garden well that picture there was not long after I'd finished my uh, treatment um, the Radiotherapy, and I went outside and saw that picture in the in the clouds. And to me, it, it can be whatever you want it to be, but to me, it was an angel. It was it was there. It was just unbelievable. So what I did, I came back into the house. I said to my wife, I "said Right, we're going to go away for a few days. We hadn't planned on doing it, but we went to Bournemouth and met up with a friend of mine. And the church on the right is the church in Bournemouth. And I, I took the picture because you wouldn't believe it if you see closely where it says." talk to us there are poles so the poles for the Samaritan sign is right in the churchyard and I just thought it was surreal where it was if you look up talk to us which was either Samaritan or talk to God but at the end of the day the message is that talk keep talking and don't stop talking because cancer will destroy you if you let it you must open up and try and get it all out by talking and sharing Help yourself. You can actually help other people as well because people want to hear how you've survived, and that gives them the strength to to work out how they can do this journey as well. And that my final slide was a picture outside my house a long time ago, but I took it years ago. It's simple as that. The rainbow, yeah. The greater the storm, the brighter the rainbow. My 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 storm to a degree still raging. <laughs> And in the background, there are still intermittent rainbows that come through. Um, mm. but I believe that somewhere along the line, I was given this condition. And I used to think, why, why have I been given this? But because it's rare, that means that I've got something that I can talk about. And I'm going to never stop talking about it. So thank you for listening.